Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. This is your host, Deb Crow. And as I reflect this morning on all the amazing leaders I've had on the show, I felt compelled to think about and recite a quote from Michael Jordan that has always kind of been close to my heart. And he says, quote, earn your leadership every day end quote. So I just want you to tuck that into the front of your mind today and and see where that takes you and, and how do you show up every day. And I say that because it makes me think about my guest today. Let me tell you a little bit about Eileen Sherman. She is a playwright, a lyricist, a young adult novelist. She's a writer for television, theater, a music producer. When she's writing musical theater, she often collaborates with her sister and composer, Gail Bluestone. From such illustrious stages as Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, Feinstein's, 54 Below, Symphony Space, Hallmark Cards, Crown Center, The Bitter End, and radio airwaves across the world. Through the years, Eileen's work has received numerous honors, including two Emmy Awards, the National Jewish Book Award, and the International Reading Association Teacher's Choice Award. In addition, she has, along with producing partner Grant Malloy Smith, co-founded the Indie Collaborative. And we're gonna talk to her about that today, this wonderful organization. So Eileen, Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for that lovely introduction. It's my pleasure and delight to be here. Well, I am so grateful for your time, your expertise, and having someone refer you to be on the show and say, Eileen's a heart-centered leader, Deb. You need to meet her. You need to interview her. And here we are. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's so, it's, it's an honor for me and you've had such success in your career. So I'm going to jump right in with my leadership questions if you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Now I mentioned in the bio that you co-founded the Indie Collaborative with Grant Malloy Smith, who was recently on the show. Could you share with the listeners where this vision came from and how you and Grant turned this into your tangible reality? Well, that's a great question um, because it is a most unique experience in my lifetime. Um, Grant and I uh, were both members of the Recording Academy and Grammy voters, and um, we connected just by chance on uh, Facebook, on social media. And Grant, I'm, if you've uh, in, um, you know interviewed him, you know he's a very funny guy. And uh, I did not know who he was. I didn't know anything about his music, um, but he made me laugh every day. I would read his posts and he was just so delightful. And um, I was having an, um, a particular professional experience at that time. Um, I had been living in Kansas City for 35 years where my career actually began uh, in musical theater. But at this point, I was living in New York City and I had connected to uh, a lot of other um, wonderful indie artists in all fields of music. And being, of course, in New York City, I was invited almost every night, oh, come see me at this show and come see me at that show. And uh, I was going, I was going and meeting the people. I thought it was fabulous, Um, but I realized I was not going to be able to necessarily do that on a one-to-one experience every single night of my life. 
um, because my husband would like me at home too. Um, so, uh, so I had this idea and Grant seemed so personal and he seemed to be very well known within the indie community that I said to Grant, I said, how about when we are both at going to the Grammy Awards, how about if we meet each other in person and I've got this idea. And I basically found him in the crowd and I walked up to him and I said, I'm Eileen Sherman. And he said, yes. And I said, and remember, I said, I had this idea and I started to tell it to him. And within two sentences, he says, I'm in. And my idea was that we basically reach out to indie artists from every kind of genre, every kind of walk of music, as you might say, and, um, and basically try to get together and share each other's music work experience, um, professional successes, professional difficulties, and try to be there for each other. Unbeknownst to me, Grant, in his own way, was doing the same thing. And so that's why after two sentences, he says, I'm in. Well, at that point, I'm again, I'm in New York City. And because my expertise is musical theater, um, I'm very involved in both the Dramatist Guild and the Drama League. And the Drama League, where I had done another program for one of my own um, uh, projects, I thought they had the perfect room where, you know, we could just invite maybe, you know, 40, 50 uh, indie artists from all kinds of genres and get together and start talking about this and introduce ourselves to each other. Um, and so, uh, I, but I had Grant come to the room because I wanted to make sure he's really a tech guru and, um, and the tech part is not basically my strongest suit. So I wanted to make sure that we'd be all set. And um, he came, he loved it. We sat down on the sofa in the uh, reception area of the Drama League, which is down in Tribeca. And uh, we created the Indie Collaborative. And the night that our first night was June 8th, uh, 2015, and uh, we expected about 40 or 50 people. The room could only hold 75. I think we had 77 people in attendance. And so we were busting at the seams. <laughs> and um, what happened is, is that as you well know, in today's world, people are flashing pictures on their telephone immediately and posting in real time. And as we were having this event, Grant was getting um, requests on his phone. When are you coming to our town to do the Indie Collaborative, to have an event like this? Because it was really very special. Everybody had five minutes. They could either um, just talk about their music they could perform something, they could inspire with a special event that had happened to them. So it was really a very, very interesting um, experience. And we were all coming from different styles of music. As you know, Grant's world is Americana roots. I'm musical theater. I mean, you know, again, um, typically, someone what Grant was doing in his professional career and what I was doing working with many Broadway people, we would never even know each other or certainly not come together and join forces. But the two of us just saw this as an opportunity to expand basically everyone's horizons and then to offer the idea because the mission of the Indie Collaborative, as the name says, is that people from all genres find each other and then create new and unique collaborations. And that's exactly what has happened. So within that first year and or two years, we ended up going to cities all over the country. We expanded around the world and we're now over 2000 members worldwide. And we are there for each other and some fantastic collaborations have come out of this. So I'm, I'm really, really thrilled. I know one of your dear friends and the gentleman who introduced the two of us, Mike Greenlee, he and Grant just this year uh, put together a wonderful song called I See You, which really has deals with this whole issue of ageism and respecting people as they grow older and not discarding them. And again, 
that's right now, that's up for a Grammy Award. That is in um, contention right now for a, a Grammy Award. So um, it, it's a very, very exciting um, project that Grant and I put together. Well, I want to congratulate you. And as I listen to you tell, you know, how that vision came to fruition and is now this amazing tangible reality. It is such an extension of both you and Grant as heart-centered leaders. And Mike Greenlee actually just sent me by FedEx the Indie Collaborative magazine, which I'm excited to open and read. So I just want to wish you all the best. And both you and Grant as co-founders coming from such a diversity in the arts it's, it's sure to be successful. I think anything you two touch turns to gold. Oh, thank you very much. Very, very appreciated. Thank you. Now, my second question that all my guests get on the podcast is, what imperfections do you think you bring to your heart-centered leadership? Um, yes, and I knew that you were going to ask that, so I've been really thinking about that very, very carefully. And um, and I I imagine that most people who are working with others and trying to lead others, um, they might agree with my answer. And my answer is this: I think that a great leader. And, and, and a successful leader, not necessarily great, but a successful leader is a person who knows how to inspire and inspire in such a way that the people who are part of a project, any project, share, share and have ownership of the same kind of, of passion for it, the same kind of pride in it, the same kind of integrity for it. Now, that sounds easier said than done because when, and I know as a producer, and yes, I produce, I produce uh, albums, music albums, I've produced uh, a, a few of mine, but I also have produced theater and I also have produced with uh, Grant concerts. So when you are producing, and every kind of producing is a little bit different, every project, I was told this by a wonderful mentor years ago, every project, you think that you have figured it out after you go through the ropes, the, you know, one time, a second time, a 10th time, but every time it's like you're starting all over again. But every time you're producing, you're surrounding yourselves with first the pe people that you feel are the very, very best for the job, but not just the best for the job, but people who can also work with everyone else on your team. And so to do that, you really are surround yourself with very, very diverse personalities, people who are coming from different parts of uh, artistic world, people from different walks of life, different people from who live life differently. And so I think that my greatest, I would say my imperfection is that every time I surround myself with a new group of people or combining new groups of people, how do you again, look to each person respecting that person's artistry, respecting that person's personality, and then be able to inspire them to share my vision as we're going forward. And that is really juggling a lot of balls in the air. So I would say that as to be a really successful leader, that's what you need to do. And it's always the greatest challenge. Well, it is because everybody has their imperfections. And one of the biggest reasons I started this podcast is, you know, we display them in our behavior, but we need to talk about them and we need to put them on the table because everyone is about progression. There's not anybody walking this earth today that is perfect. And I liked the way you frame that. And again, given the work that you've done and the diversity in the arts, you've always worked with different teams. I can only imagine what it would be like to be in a room with a bunch of creatives. So, so well done, Eileen. Thank you. <laughs>
Now, I would love for you in my next question to share with the listeners, tell us where your love of the arts derived from. Well, I think, and you know, I may be wrong, but I think that there's a, a, a genetic quality to it. I can remember as young and I'm probably, probably a lot older than many of your listeners, but I can remember um, when I'm about four years old, discovering on television, the original Mickey Mouse show. And I can still see myself lying in the hallway of our little bungalow and the, the television was our little black and white TV was on the other side of the living room. And I would watch the Mickey Mouse show and the Mouseketeers singing and dancing. And that's what I wanted to do. I did not care about Mickey or Minnie Mouse in the cartoons. I didn't care about Disneyland. I didn't care about any of that. But when I saw the kids singing and particularly the youngest ones, cause I'm four and there were a couple on there that were, I mean, my husband still teases me. I know them, Cubby and, and Karen, they were four and five years old. I think uh, Cubby was, it became this very, very successful drummer. And these kids were so multi-talented and I lived for that program from it was on every day for an hour. And I can remember, I'm probably about five or six, when the Disney um, and the Masketeer Club was cut down to 30 minutes. And I basically had a rebellion at home telling my mom, what do you mean they cut it? It's got to be an hour. So I remember that feeling. And my parents, well, we did not have a lot of money, but they would go in. I grew up in Atlantic City and actually Ventnor. If people know their Monopoly um, uh, board uh, and the original Monopoly game, I grew up on Atlantic Avenue and, um, and I can um, remember my parents would go into New York maybe once a year to see a Broadway musical and they'd bring home the album. And I would sing and dance around my living room. And when, you, when you're in a room with a lot of people who do end up going into musical theater, this is like they, everyone has the same story. It's that thrill. And those, those 33s and those vinyl albums were my connection to that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Broadway. I wanted to be part of that musical theater world. And... You know, even to sometimes today when nobody's around and I put that music on, I'll still get up and dance around the living room. So I think though that my whole family, my father had a magnificent voice. My sister Gail is this phenomenal, um, you know, musician, pianist, and really, really understands all styles of music. And she of course is my writing partner when we write musicals. And so we would have these wonderful family, um, you know, sing-alongs as we were growing up and all our friends would come, they still talk about it. So I think it was just a very, very natural environment without being a person who really grew up, as they say, in the business. Because I do have some friends who grew up in the business with their families, their parents and grandparents, all part of that theater world. But that was something I always wanted to be part of and I still, I love it the same with the same passion. But I think maybe it was just a genetic thing. It was, that's what drew me to life. It, it kind of gives me that get up and go when I hear a great musical tune. Well, what a beautiful story. And, and without knowing, I, I almost had some intuition that this stemmed from when you were a young girl, just looking at again, the diversity of what you've done in the art. So what a beautiful story. And it's nice to see all the collaboration you do with your sister. So you're definitely keeping it in the family. Yes, I, I am. I am. Yes. <laughs> now, My last leadership question would be, what advice would you give to a young person who was considering or had made up their mind to pursue a career in the arts? Um, I think that um, it is very, very important to not to not to be scared of failure. 
And I think this is true for anything you want to do in, in, in life. This is something I've always tried to teach my own children. Um, in the arts, you know, my, my husband is a physician and my son, who is both a physician and also a producer, a music and theater producer, he basically got a little bit of each of his parents. Um, and they, when you're in, when you when you are in a, um, a career like teaching, uh, medicine, accounting, engineering, there are what I used to see as a track. You do this, then you do this next step, then you do that next step. And if you keep, you keep working at it, and while you may have your disappointments, you still, there is a track. You are on track. The arts are not like that. The arts are not necessarily a track. The arts are keep doing, keep doing, keep doing. And you may be knocked down again and again and again. And what you need to know is that you need to have this belief in what you do in who you are and in the art that you want to present. And I can talk to you not just as a songwriter, and not just as a playwright, but also as a young adult novelist and knowing at the early part of my career, I used to keep every rejection letter I got. And I'm sure that if I had ever counted them, we probably would have gone up to close to a thousand because I was always putting my work out there. And while I would get a an acceptance here for every acceptance, I might have gotten 25 or 50 rejections. And that is just how it goes. And even people who are very, very famous, they will tell you at a certain point that they have an idea. And if there's no money for that project, they not may not be able to run with that project. So the arts are about basically being tenacious, being determined, being basically not just not overconfident, but confident in that your vision is something that needs to be said and needs to be fulfilled. And that you always, when you have that phrase to be thinking outside the box, definitely. And that's not just because the arts are not just about creating art, the, the, most, the, the most successful artist is not just about creating art, but also how to find that audience for the art and market that art and how clever you are in that area. So I would say just be tenacious. That's, that would be my best advice, not to give up and to figure if one thing doesn't work, then try something else. So that is my best advice for a young person going into the arts. Well, and that's sound advice. And, and one of my favorite phrases in leadership is let's fail forward. So that's, mm -hmm. be that's beautiful. Now I like to switch gears and end the, pa the podcast with what I call my fab four. And these are just four fun questions, whatever sitting on the top of your head, short answer. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. Question number one. What inspires you? I think music inspires me and also great, a great turn of the phrase. I get my best philosophy out of listening to and watching some wonderful theater and that does inspire me. Number two, what is your favorite play of all time? Oh, well, I will say, I will say this is my favorite because it was such a wonderful moment in the theater for me. Um, Cause it's, it's very hard to say one when you love theater, but I would say cabaret. The very first time I saw it, it was my sweet 16 present and I had never quite seen 
you know, that kind of, you know, cabaret can be pretty raw. And of course, it's a very, very important uh, play as well, its message. But the, uh, the staging of it and the music of it, I mean, was just, I, I was crying at the end. And my mom said, why are you crying? I said, because I just never wanted it to end. And years later, I was very, very lucky enough to be able to work um, on one of my uh, charity CDs uh, with the director of that, Hal Prince. So I was very, very lucky to meet him, the great genius be uh, behind Cabaret. Wonderful. My third question is going to put your creativity and innovation quickness on the line here. 2020 has been an interesting year. If you had to come up with a title for a play to represent 2020, what do you think you'd call it? The big surprise. <laughs> Definitely, right? Yes. <laughs> and my last question. But I'd like to say that probably might be the working title. The I work. might, with a little bit of time, might think of something even better. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, with your creativeness. <laughs> My last question for you is, Eileen Sherman, what do you want your legacy to be? I, I want my legacy to be what I've always taught my children, which is I always try to do the right thing. And even when that's not the easy thing, even then when that's not what I really want to do, I always try to do the right thing. And if I am doing the wrong thing, I own it. I know that I've done the wrong thing. And that's what I'd like my legacy to be. Well, that's a wonderful outlook. And I think that you are known for that. And I think that that will be your legacy. I want to say how delightful it's been to chat with you and to meet you. I've enjoyed our conversation that we had before today. I've enjoyed interviewing you. And I think that you are such just a wonderful addition to the arts and everything that you've brought and created. And I just want to wish you continued success. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it's been a delight to be here. And I'm thrilled that Mike brought the two of us together. So thank you. Absolutely. I like to end my podcast with a list of five things that I believe allows us to live a purposeful life. Follow your heart, have passion, do your best, know your truth, and always be in love with the journey. This is Deb Crow. Thank you for joining me once again on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership podcast.